And welcome to another edition of the What Is Truth radio show right here on WECK Radio. Uh, we've been with you for years on Saturday mornings, but uh, there, there's some plans in the wind that we'll be moving to Sunday. We will let you know when that will be a reality. Uh, Sunday's the Lord's Day. Saturday is uh, the Sabbath day. Either day is good for hearing the word of the Lord, and that's what we do right here. Dr. Michael Caesar here in our new studio, 271 Bucyrus at Grace and Truth Church, which incidentally, you can uh, watch podcasts of this uh, a broadcast at the Grace and Truth Church, uh, spell it out, graceandtruthchurch.org website. Just click the sermons tab, click YouTube, and you can uh, see the podcast. And this morning, we're going to speak to you about a very interesting topic. My partner in truth, uh, Mark Sassy, our street preaching evangelist and uh, excellent uh, Bible student, was reading in the Bible and came up with a great passage that's uh, in a great gospel, the gospel of Mark. A, a brother, Amen. share with us the idea that God was speaking to your heart on. Amen. Well, you know, when, when you're taking time alone and reading the Bible, and you're sitting and reading a King James Bible, there's times where certain things, I don't care who you are or where you are, God will speak to you through his word. Yes, sir. And in the gospel of Mark, something that kept echoing in in my mind, in my spirit, is uh, what is right in the very beginning yeah. of chapter one in the Gospel of Mark. And it starts out this way. It says, uh, verse one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verse three, it says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And then John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So what's going on here is that John the Baptist is the, uh, the crier. He's, uh, he's repeating a message that 700 years earlier, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah was uh, prophesying that. I guess we should go there in Isaiah sure. chapter 40. Isaiah 40, that's a great cross-reference. And so... It's a message that was given 700 years before the Lord showed up, before he was born in Bethlehem. And it was a timely message because he's telling people to get ready. Yeah. Get ready because Jesus is coming. God is coming. Yep. And so here we are, Isaiah chapter 40. And let me see, verse 3. Again, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Right? Amen. And Amen. I should go one more verse here, because sure. verse 6 says, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, why is he saying that? Isaiah is saying that because our life is short. Our physical life on earth is short, and these people, they need to get ready because the Lord is coming. And I don't know if anybody's been paying attention out there, but there's a lot of talk that the Lord's coming a second time, that he's coming a second time soon to a place near you. And so yeah. with that happening, uh, the message is clear again for now that you need to uh, prepare ye. Ye in, in the King James is talking about all of All ye. of us. Yes. Sure. And sometimes people get a little uh, worried or confused about the these and the thous. Thee is personal, where he's talking to one person, like thee, me, right? And thou is the same thing. It's yeah, personal. I say unto thee, Mark. Yes. I'm speaking to thou personally. Yes. Yeah. But ye is he speaking to everyone. Everyone out there needs to heed the call and pay attention and prepare because the Lord is coming. And now we're in a day and age where he's coming again. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I was growing up and it's mentioned, it's referenced in culture many times about the second coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord. And often the references I would hear 
in movies or television was kind of like, yep, the second coming of the Lord. But people have been talking about this for centuries. And and they started to wonder if it was just a tradition or a myth that people made up. But in the Bible right here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 28, just, just to show you, this is a biblical a doctrine about the second coming. It says, uh, Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, semicolon, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Amen. Without sin unto salvation. He's not going to have to die on a cross again to pay for sin, but he's coming back a second time. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, you're looking at this teaching in Mark, and it would seem to have probably a dual application. There was an application to the people living in the first century because it was the first coming. Probably an application to those of us in the 21st century because we're on the cusp of the second coming. Yes. And people kind of sense something is going on. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're not noticing that things are changing in the world, you're not paying attention. And yeah. I was just thinking in, in the Minor Prophets, in the book of Hosea, in chapter 6, verse 2, it says, After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now, Peter talks about that also in Second Peter chapter 3, yes. where after two days. And, and Peter says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Amen. So there's been 2,000 years since Christ was here. Everybody knows that. And after two days, he's coming again. So whenever it's going to be, the point is he, he's making that call to prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So I remember the first time going through, through my Bible, I remember reading that and I thought, okay, that's a good call to get prepared and everything. But what does he mean by how do you prepare for the way of the Lord and how do you make his path straight? You know, there's something more to that. I'm just not sure, sure what it is. Sure. And so you have to consider that when he's telling you to prepare, He's saying that the king is coming, right? And in the old days, in ancient days, when a king would come into a village or come into a city, they would send a herald before the king, and they would send a, an announcer or a town crier, yeah. and he would come in and say, get ready, the king is coming. Yeah, the right? forerunner would show up first. Like today with the president, they send the advance team there first to let everyone know, president's coming next week, we're getting things ready, we're preparing the path he's going to take down this street. Yeah, Right, they're going to secure the area, yeah, yeah. right? A lot of security. <laughs> and so there's a lot of examples of that. I mean, if you just stop and consider for a minute, think about if, uh, if you're in the military, and let's say your military unit is expecting a visit from a two-star general. You think maybe your shoes are going to be spit-shined and the barracks are going to be extremely clean and everything's going to be neat and tidy. The grass is going to be freshly mowed. And everything's sure. going to be ready sure. because he's coming. Right? Coming to inspect the troops, probably. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. It's a, it's a, it's a troop inspection. Yeah. <laughs> and so people are familiar with getting prepared. Uh, we're getting close to Thanksgiving. People get prepared for trips, they get prepared for family get-togethers, they yep. get prepared for a big meal, and they get the house cleaned up and everything all set. People get ready for Christmas gatherings. You know what else people get ready for? And hopefully it's not coming right away, but they get ready for snowstorms. Sure. They get ready sure. for blizzards. Sure. You know, they make sure they got water in the house, they got a snow shovel, yep. all that good stuff. Yeah, and I used to remember all the time in school getting ready for exams and for tests and preparing for that. and. Yep. It, it, it took time. It took a little effort. It didn't happen accidentally. I just couldn't walk into an exam room and just take it off the top of my head. I had, there was some study involved in doing it. Right. And so in this case, the Bible says to prepare, right? You yep. the way of the Lord. Yep. And I mentioned before that a town crier, a herald comes before, and I bet you almost everybody listening has heard of this song. This is coming out of the hymn book. It's called Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. Oh, one of the right? great hymns. And I, if we just listen to the words of this song, I'm sure it's going to sound familiar to you, a lot of you. Uh, the first line is, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild, God and Sinners Reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, Join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Yeah. This is, that's a great song. Yeah. And then if we keep going, it says, Christ, by highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, 
Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity. That's him. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Which means God with us. God with us. Yeah, yeah. There's some great stuff in this song. And here, the last line, it says, Hail, the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail, the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Yeah. Mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Yeah. That's an interesting ending to that Christmas song because sure. he says, born to give them second birth. Well, we were just talking about the king coming a second time, right? Yeah. And all through the Bible, there's warnings about prepare. I think of a, a good one. I think you might even have this sign on your car. I do. Uh, From in Amos, Amos chapter 4, 12, prepare says, to meet thy God. I, I got to ask you now. There's a lot of Bible verses you could have put on the back of your car sure. to make people consider about God. Why that one? Well, because my thought is, you know, we were reading before about the second coming of Christ. I want to get back to that one verse because that verse is connected to another verse in the second coming of Christ. And, and this is, again, back in Hebrews chapter 9. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. And to them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? Because the verse before that's connected to it says, is it appointed? It has been appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so the point is, there is a day where our soul will be separated from our body and we will stand before God, the judge of all. And, and because at that judgment we needed help, Christ was offered to bear our sins. Amen. <laughs> so we wouldn't have to stand there naked and covered in sin. And so I figure people need to realize, get ready to meet God. For example, driving a car, you know, a sudden uh, T-bone accident or someone coming across a double yellow line can hit them. Are you prepared to meet God? So the lady that made the sign for me she put it on the left side of my car to the left side of the little nissan insignia and then on the right side so it says prepare to meet thy god on the left side and then on the right side of the insignia it says you must be born again because there's no better way to prepare to meet god amen but yeah, yeah. that's the idea and, people and, need to be ready and that's the first step of preparation because the bible you know says that either you're saved or you're lost. Yes. A lot of people, you know, remember about this parable that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and they hear it and they they recognize this old phrase about the prodigal son. Yep. But I don't find the word prodigal in Luke chapter 15. What I find twice in there is I find the lost son. Yes. And if I turn there real quick, a great story and a true story that true Jesus story. told. A amen. And so. What's going on is that there is a separation between someone who is lost and someone who is saved. So uh, we'll get into this. I think we got time. I'll just sure, I'll start sure. with verse 11. And this is Jesus. He said, a certain man had two sons. Yep. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. This is a Jew. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I want to pause there for a second. Do you realize that this story is not just about this one particular guy, but it's about every particular person out there? Sure. That sure. we all have run away from God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that we, we run away and, and we're, we're starving when it ought not to be, right? And in verse 20, it says, And he arose and he came to his father. 
But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and he ran, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And, Interesting. And if I go down to the very end of the chapter, verse 32, it says, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And the question today is, could that be you? Could that be you out there that maybe, maybe you've never been saved? That you've never had a day in your life where you know that you can look back on that time and you, you know that you've uh, asked God to forgive your sins, that you've asked to receive Jesus Christ into your heart, because that's what the Bible requires. God, God doesn't require much. He just requires just a little faith, and that's how you come to him by faith. Yeah, and I remember the first time I heard about that, he was dead, and then I remember the Apostle Paul writing in Ephesians to the uh, folks who went to that church, and he was making them think back on their past condition, and he says in chapter 2, and you you Ephesians, hath he quickened, that's to give new life, who were dead in trespasses and sins. They weren't physically dead. They were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead to God because of all the sins and the trespasses on their soul, and God is holy, and he keeps a, a distance from people like that. And people like that are like the one you just read in the parable. They're someone that, uh, Father, I don't exactly want to live this holy life with you. Can I just have what I can and run off into the world and, and live the way they do? But you find out that over time, that story you were reading, I mean, he said, after I, I ran out of money and I was out of my substance and I spent all, uh, I, I was in want and no man gave him anything. I mean, the world's not going to give you things. You got nothing to give the world. They're not interested in you anymore. And, and you've sinned and you're, in, you're despondent and you're in despair. And then God's desire is you, like this young boy did, he came to himself and he thought about it. Wait a second, my father in heaven it has many great servants having a relationship with him and he feeds them spiritually and they're taken care of and I'm in want spiritually. If I just go back with a simple confession, Father, I have sinned before thee. You, you know that story, the father came running and, and put his arms around that child before he was cleaned up. Amen. He just grabbed him as he was and said, I have a robe for you. It's the robe of my son's righteousness. And he went from being dead in sin and being lost from his father to being found again and having new life. That's he, he turned and he went back home. There you go. To his father. There you go. And there's a verse in later in Mark's gospel, Mark 115, where it says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repenting is turning. Repenting is turning. Yeah. And, you know, I ran into an old friend that I haven't seen in, I don't know, 10 years, just the other night. And I asked him how the kids are doing and everything. <laughs> you know, I haven't seen him in so long. And he told me that, uh, you know, his one son had some health issues and uh, things were a little hard. And and uh, he told his son, he says, well, you and your wife come come back, move in with us for a while. And his son's grown. He's a grown man. He says, well, I don't know if I should do that. He goes, are you kidding? Come back home. Yeah, That's what we're here for. We're here to help. A father full of a heart of compassion and love. Yes. Like modeled after the father in heaven. Amen. Was that Amen. compassion and love? Yeah. And Amen. so um, there's a verse... A striking verse back in Jeremiah chapter 8, where it says in 820, the harvest is past, yeah. the summer is ended, and we are not saved. You, you really have to consider that God's word is compelling each and every one of us to get saved. And it, it's not just Old Testament stuff or maybe just, you know, the writings of Paul, but you find it in the words of Christ himself. Uh, I'm thinking of in, in, everybody's familiar with the gospel given out in, in John. You know, how many times at a football game or something have you seen John 3.16? Sure. And Common verse, the, yeah. the gospel is, you know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Now, I was just talking about, are you saved? Listen to the next verse. Verse 17 of John 3. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why does it say might? Because it's your will. It's yeah. your choice. Your choice. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, just like that lost son in uh, the parable in Luke, he had to come to himself, come to his senses, and realize that the right thing to do is to repent, turn, and come back to his father. Yeah. And that's the way it is. And so some of the other verses that talk about preparing, uh, what are we trying to prepare? prepare? In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3, it says, Prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. Now, why would it say prepare your hearts? Well, uh, I've had this conversation with so many people in the last month. It seems like it just keeps coming up. I ask people, what are they trusting in? Because people get frustrated with the news. They get frustrated with the lies and the false reporting. And so when people are frustrated, I ask them, well, what do you trust or who do you trust? And they're like, I don't know where to turn. I don't know. I don't know. And I say, well, okay. And at the end of things, what do you follow? And they say, well, I guess I just have to follow my heart. And I said, that's interesting because mm -hmm. isn't that the slogan for Disney World? Follow your heart? Sure, um, sure. Disney's got some problems. And without going into that, I'll just go back to Jeremiah. Of course. And uh, <laughs> in Jeremiah chapter, let me see. 17 verse 9. What are we thinking? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the uh, famous one that uh, John will often use. Just make sure I have the right one. But I'm thinking the same one. Um, the heart is deceitful above all things and, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So, so God is looking at the heart. Now, the problem with our heart, because we've been born with a fallen nature, is the compass inside of our heart doesn't work that well anymore. A good compass points true north, but a broken compass might point a little bit northwest, maybe a little bit southeast, maybe little different directions. And if I was counting on it to get me out of a forest that I was lost in, it's not going to guide me out of that forest or that woods or that mess I'm in. I need, I need a good compass. And and the heart is is deceitful. Now, what God wants to do is put truth into our heart. He wants to place truth in our heart. Amen. So we have to prepare our heart to receive the truth from God, not go according to our feelings, but trust in the faith that God has written down in his scriptures. Well, God knows a few more things than we do. He's <laughs> been around a whole lot longer than we have. He's been around the block a whole lot yeah, more. Amen. And so his word is not only perfect, uh, Psalm 19, his his word is pure. Yeah, Proverbs thirty. Yep, and not only that, Romans chapter seven. His word is holy, yep. and so you know his ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah chapter fifty five, and so all those things you have to consider. And again, about the heart, preparing the heart. I was thinking in Jeremiah earlier, where in Jeremiah nine fourteen it oh, says, that's another "But good they one. have walked after the imagination of their own heart." And after Balaam, which is a false god. Yeah. And then in the next chapter, uh, 11, verse 8, yet they obey, he says, obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. So there's a lot of warnings from the prophet Jeremiah about the heart. Sure. And God wants you to prepare your heart and get prepared to meet thy God. Because he's coming. The king is coming. Sure. And, and the Solomon wrote in Proverbs, uh, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. And, and often we've heard, you know, trust your heart, trust your heart. But the heart, again, like a broken compass, it, it, it's not going to give us the right spiritual answer. And uh, Jesus quoted from this one Psalm 118 many, many times. And one of the great things it says in that Psalm it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And, and maybe not another man, maybe even your own self and your own heart. I'm trusting my heart as, as I'm a good man. I want to trust my heart. And he's saying, no, it's better to trust in the Lord and the word of the Lord. So, so we need to prepare our heart. Now, you know, I don't want people to think 
we're talking about that four chambered organ that's inside the thorax that you know doctors and cardiologists work on that pumps all the blood yeah god god's using it in the spiritual sense the heart is like the soul they used to have that song heart and soul you know they go together i don't know the words but but that's kind of what it's like your heart is the the inner essence the soul inside of you and our soul is easily deceived obviously i mean think of how many people how many teenagers have followed the wrong path because friends led them on the wrong path a wrong booklet uh some strange writings uh some strange things they've seen in the movies have taken them down a path that have led to terrible consequences in their lives and so the soul and the heart it follows uh, various thoughts and intents and writings down here and god says no you need to prepare that heart with with truth amen and and that's what we need to do is is to find the truth and the lord like you said his word is holy his word is pure yes his word is true yes thy word is truth there you go and so you need to consider that because God knows more than we do and because he's perfect and pure that we ought to put our trust in his word, right? Over our feelings, over our emotions, over our own heart. And in Isaiah 66, God says, but to this man will I look, yeah. even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. You ought to have respect for God's word and understand that he knows far more than we do. And he wants to direct us on the, on the right path. That's a good example about the compass and having a good compass. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, well, we're, we're running out of time at the first segment, but we have a lot of good scripture to still look at because that, that forerunner that God sent, and he wrote, he wrote about him in the Old Testament, uh, hundreds of years before John the Baptist uh, showed up, uh, the Lord knew that he was going to prepare that young man. You can read about his birth in Luke chapter one, how God prepared. He actually was a cousin of Jesus. Yes, they they were, they were related. John the Baptist was six months older, but he had a great uh, mission to go forth and to prepare people uh, for the Messiah. And uh, he was just a voice crying in the wilderness like we are today in, in the the wilderness of going across the plains and the cities and the towns as these airwaves go out. We're saying to people, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight right here on WECK Radio and at Grace and Truth Church. Just spell that out, graceandtruthchurch.org, and you can get our teachings and watch the podcasts you can see how we are dressed today and we've got another half hour in this show because we want to help you as we study ourselves to prepare to get ready for that second coming of the lord right here on the what is truth radio show amen and welcome to the second half of the what is truth radio show dr michael caesar along with mark sassy uh we're doing an interesting study uh, i mean the holidays are uh, upon us again here yeah. we go it's going to be thanksgiving it's going to be christmas it's it's going to be new year's what and happened I, what happened to summer yeah <laughs> well, I, I i it was a nice summer i enjoyed yeah. it but but it goes by quickly yes. there's no doubt about it here in western new york it moves quickly and and we're getting ready we're preparing for the winter and the, and the holidays that are coming and one of the things that we'll often do around new year's time is we'll take inventory of our you know men women inventory of our lives of our family our financial situation maybe our health and we'll make some resolutions and again often they are they're practical earthly and they're wise things to do the apostle paul said in the book of first corinthians 11 let a man examine himself and that's one of the things we do when we make those new year's resolutions Amen. but when when john the baptist was saying prepare ye the way of the lord this is something spiritual. This is beyond pocketbook issues. This is beyond, uh, you know, how much do I tip the scale issues. These are things that, and they're not just temporal, they're eternal issues. And so he wants us to prepare ourselves spiritually. And you were mentioning that in 2 Corinthians, he kind of piggybacks on that idea of examining yourself and getting ready because we need to be ready to, pre to meet the Lord. Amen. Well, again, if you had somebody important coming to your home, you would want to straighten up a little bit. You would want to clean up and make things ready. 
And, you, you know, if you believe that the Bible is, uh, first of all, if you believe in God, if you believe that things are not all just an accident and all just uh, haphazard down here and you see an order to things with creation and with the conscience that's inside of you, if you recognize that, then you also have to recognize that the scriptures do talk a lot about the Lord coming again. There's songs yeah. in the hymnals about he's coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe yeah. evening, maybe soon. It maybe right? soon. Yeah. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter... I just chapter want to stop you about the believing in God thing. That's interesting. Somebody showed me a picture the other day of, of an atheist, you know, and, and supposedly atheists don't believe in God. And so they said two things atheists believe. Number one, I don't believe in God. Number two, I hate him. <laughs> well, that's, that's a strange thing. <laughs> if you don't believe in him, why do you hate him? Yeah. So kind of deep down inside, they sort of know somewhere out there, there is a divine being. I think everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. yeah deep so. down, like you say, deep down, everybody knows. <laughs> and I think maybe deep down inside of you right now, you know that he is coming again and that you're not ready. And maybe you're not even sure how you ought to be ready. Well, here, the Apostle Paul is talking, 2 Corinthians 12, 20. He says, for I fear lest when I come, and this is just Paul coming, right? He says, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, and tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. It's interesting, the topic that Paul's bringing up there in verse 21 at the end of 2 Corinthians 12, he is, again, he's telling you to examine yourself, and he's warning against one of the most problematic things that comes up in the New Testament is fleshy, lustful, problems. And you'll find that in the book of Galatians when it talks about the works of the flesh. So we can get into that in a minute. But in the next chapter, 13, verse 5, he says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So you have to, number one, get saved. If you're not 100% sure how to get saved, then go to our website and start listening to any of the gospel preaching messages. And it's really simple. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. And you need to bow the knee because the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why would you not want to do it now when you can? Because otherwise... There's destruction coming later. Jesus is coming the second time sure. to bring destruction on the world. He's going to pull the church out and then bring destruction. But um, that's why you need to be ready. Sure, sure. You were talking before you gave that great story about the prodigal son. And although it doesn't use the word prodigal in Luke chapter 15, it talks about him being lost. Yes. My son was lost. I uh, he's found again. My son was dead and he's alive again, the father says. Yes. And we were talking about the fact that um, Paul told the church in, in, Eph in Ephesus, because he tells the one in Corinthians, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith or not. Prove yourself. You should know whether Jesus Christ is in you or not, uh, whether you are saved or not. Because he said in Ephesians 2, you were dead in trespasses and sins at one time he's speaking to those members of the church who become born again in in times past you walked according to the course of this world you read the newspaper you read the the the, the magazines you, you watched the news reports you did what everyone else did according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that now worketh in this present world and in the children of disobedience because of a lot of the things that we've watched and learned they've taught us to do some of those things you were mentioning in that one chapter you know how to debate how to have uh, strife how to have wrath how to whisper how to make tumults how to envy other people he's got a new car i want one all these things that we learned and we had our conversation in the times past filling the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of our mind we were by nature the children of wrath because all these things doesn't bring the blessing of god it 
brings the wrath of God. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in our sins, now hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. Your salvation is the gift of God. It's, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And, and Paul's saying, you got to examine yourself. Did you come to Christ on bended knee asking for grace and mercy? Or did you rather come with an offering in your hand and said, I got something to offer you rather than receive the offering of, of eternal life he has for you? It's a and, difference between being prideful or yeah, humble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to understand that God is God and you're not, and you need to come humbly before God. Um, he, he says that in Second Peter 3 that people are ignorant and, and scoffers yeah. in the last yeah. days. And that is, that's very prideful. But if I just look at that real quick, uh, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, like you were just talking about. Yeah. And they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And yeah. for this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, if I go a little further in chapter, verse 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ah, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, you have to understand God's coming again, and when he comes again, you have to be ready. Whether you're lost, whether you're saved, uh, people have sins. People have besetting sins. People need to uh, consider, again, today what John the Baptist was saying. When he says, prepare ye the way of the Lord, you need to soften your heart. You need to prepare your heart. How do you do that? Well, the water of the word. How many times have you seen hard hard, rocky ground. You pour water on that a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and it starts to soften it up. And this is the water of the word. You need to get into a King James Bible and soften your heart and then prepare your heart for the Lord. And then the, the next part of the, the verse that we started with was, it says, make his paths straight. Well, what kind of path or paths? Well, you want to repent from sin. And like I mentioned, besetting sins. It talks about that in Romans. I think it's uh, chapter 7, maybe. 7 or 8, somewhere around there. But uh, you should read the book of Romans, especially if you're Roman Catholic. You should definitely read the book of Romans. Oh, John, that's, John that's and Romans. That's a great book. It's like God wrote that book to you. He, he sent his apostle to Rome, and he wants, he really does want a Catholic that's a universal faith. That what would be for everybody, and it's found in the book of Romans, not so much in the city of Rome, but in the book of Romans. And, and it's a great book to read. Just the first eight chapters alone, and you will get great blessings. Amen. Everyone that in history that has read it has been blessed. There are so many testimonies of men. Even the, uh, the Christmas carol you just read from Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uh, Charles Wesley and his brother, always preached out of the book of Romans. That's where they got a lot of those verses. Like you said, the first eight <laughs> chapters of yeah, Romans yeah. Are, are amazing chapters. Yeah. yeah. So you, you really need to get into that. But making his path straight, his, that's the Lord, making his path straight because he's coming again. And is he coming for you? Are you part of the family of God? You know, the Bible says that we are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So you got to place your faith in him. So to prepare your heart, you need to be humble and not proud. And you need to do things to draw close to the Lord. One thing is to read the Bible. Another is to study. And how about to pray? I mean, how many people are spending time praying these days? And is it a, uh, a prayer where it's just me, me, me? Or is it a prayer where you're concerned about others and concerned about drawing close unto God? Um, you can spend time with godly music 
instead of having all your time with a 24-hour news channel just driving you crazy, <laughs> right? And if you look at the example from the Lord Jesus, he prayed before, he, it says he prayed often, right? He would rise up early to pray. He prayed before he made an important decision to choose his 12 apostles. He prayed before he went to Calvary. He prayed at Gethsemane, right? So he gave the example for us. And we ought to be caring for others through giving out the gospel, you know, sharing that with people to help people and reach out to people. These are things to prepare making his path straight. And if you remember when we read back in Isaiah 40, Yep. It had another part of this that we didn't see in Mark, and it's also found in Luke chapter 3. Right, Luke, Luke, Luke 3, that's and, right. And that verse talks about that, uh, I better read it again. So it, it's found in... Uh, you want to read Isaiah and I'll read Luke, or do you want to read... How do you I'll, I'll do go it? to Luke. Okay. So here we go. So in Luke chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Luke says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now listen to this next verse. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And then in Isaiah? Sure, and, and in Isaiah, he said... Um, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Very interesting. This one says the salvation of God will be seen. Yes. And this says the glory of the Lord, because one of the greatest, most glorious acts that God has ever done on behalf of mankind and men and women and children that are struggling in this world with all the trials and all the tribulations and all the heartache and all the, the deaths of, from cancer and all the things like that, and they're broken in spirit. One of the greatest things God has done, the greatest thing God has done, the most glorious thing God has done is come to rescue people through the work of salvation. And, and that's what he wants to do. And those places in your heart that are low down, that our valleys will be lifted up. Amen. And the mountains and the hills of pride, God will knock those down. Amen. And the crooked places that have been bent out of wrong way, he'll make those straight. And the rough places that have caused the problems in the relationships, Amen. he'll plane those down and make them straight again. God's desire is to bring peace on earth, like it says in Hark the Herald. The angels are singing peace on earth, uh, mercy mild. That's exactly what God wants, but he has to bring it one heart at a time, and hearts need to prepare to receive that glorious gift, the glory of God and the salvation of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Everything you just said in like one minute or less sums up that whole verse about the, the four things that you find there about the valley, every valley shall be filled. Amen. The mountain and hill shall be brought low. That's number two. The crooked shall be made straight, yep. straight, number three. And the rough ways, number four, shall be made smooth. And I had my own thoughts on this. Go and you just, you just rattled them. off all Sorry. the same. No, <laughs> you, you, you did uh, like the valley. A lot of people get down in a valley. They get depressed. They yeah. get low. They get brokenhearted. Yeah. Sometimes there's emotional drama going on. There's bitterness, and sometimes there's not forgive, not forgiveness, right? But even though you're hurt, think about the fact that you know great athletes they get hurt. Sure. In the NFL, guys play hurt all the time. The great ones do. They 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 carry on, you know. And uh, that, that's how we ought to be. And there's, there's some examples of that in Proverbs. But uh, the mountain and the hill, you know, there's mountains of pride, like you said. A pride cometh before a fall. Mm -hmm. And there's a really good verse I like in Exodus 10, verse 3, where God says, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself? Question mark. Yeah. And now's a good time. Now's a good time to get ready your heart. And then the crooked places... This world's crooked. It's a perverse world. There's lots of liars and cheaters and stuff, but we're crooked. We need to purge that sin out of our life, and uh, that, that's something that we really need to do. Uh, and the rough ways, there's a lot of rough things in this world. There's harshness, gossip, there's anger without a cause, and there's a simple 
verse in the Bible in Colossians 4 where it says, let your speech be all way with grace, seasoned with salt, because the Lord wants us to care for one another. Yeah. And, you know, while we're, t- while we're thinking about how to prepare your heart, I got to go to Galatians. I, I was just thinking about this. In Galatians 5, he tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is and what the works of the flesh are in right around. Oh, that's quite a great co- contrast. Yeah, verse 19 versus uh, verse 22. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you want me to read it? Or? The works of the flesh are manifest. You, you can see them everywhere. Uh, and they're these, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, you know, th- those uh, magazines with the centerfolds and the lasciviousness, again, uh, more of those uh, pictures and things like that. Idolatry. Uh, in the old days, it was statues. Today, it's making idols of, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe bank accounts, maybe people, things like that. Uh, witchcraft, hatred. How many people are angry and groups are angry one at another? Variants. Uh, uh, he does it that way. I do it this way. Emulations. Just trying to imitate people and emulate uh, certain things. And sadly, many of the things that we emulate are not good things. Uh, how many shots can he drink? I'm going to try and follow that, uh, that type of thing. Wrath. Strife. Uh, seditions. That's uprisings. Heresies. Those are teachings that are contrary to God's word. Envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like things as you just watch people living according to the flesh. By the way, I think about that, Brother Mark. Um, You know, when God made man, he made man in his image. Now it's true. We have a body, and our body has a nervous system. And our nervous system has things that feel uncomfortable to it and things that feel good to it. Uh, we have a stomach, and our stomach uh, gets hungry, and there's yeah. times we want to fill that stomach. We have a, a desire maybe for having uh, sexual relations, and it feels good sometime. Now, But we also have a soul and a spirit and the ability to reason and to think. And God doesn't want us to live according to our fleshy lust. That's how animals live. Right. They just live according to what feels good. I want to procreate and I want to eat. And th- those are the only things that guide them. We're supposed to live above those fleshy lusts that he described here. But the fruit of the spirit. Amen. Is, and that's with a capital S. This is something God wants to give to those that have prepared their heart to see the glory of the Lord and receive the salvation of God. This is what God wants to give to your heart and your soul and to lift up those valleys. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. I can put up with things and I don't fly off the handle. Gentleness, great thing for parents with their children, goodness with the neighbor, faith toward God, building that up, meekness and temperance. And he says against such, there's no law. No one would try and outlaw that stuff. That's the best stuff you could hope for. Amen. Amen. And just a couple of verses after that, it says, if we live in the spirit with a capital S, God's spirit, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And I couldn't help but notice as, as I'm looking at these, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. And nine is a good number throughout the Scriptures. Oh, yeah. it, it always represents the fruit of the Spirit. And it just happens to be found in Galatians 5.22. 5 plus 2 plus 2 is 9. And there happens to be nine fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. You can and also is, find it in Ephesians I, 5 verse 9. I believe this is the ninth book of the New Testament, Galatians, ah. if, if I counted correctly. Let me just check in the front of my Bible. One, two, three. Yeah, that's the ninth book of the, of the, of the Bible. And curiously, in English, that's... Uh, Nine letters, G-A-L-A-T-I-A-N-S. It's, so it's the ninth book with nine letters, and it's 522, nine, and nine, the number of fruit, which incidentally is how long it takes for a woman to Amen. bear fruit That's is right. nine months. Yeah. yeah. All these, all these so, quinky dinks, yeah, you know, all these coincidences, the but, <laughs> but, but God himself is very mathematical because he does things perfectly. And then when you consider the works of the flesh, if you count through those, You'll find there's 18 of them. The last one is and such like, meaning 
anything like these things. Uh-huh. And if you count that last one, there's 18 works of the flesh, which is a number of 6 plus 6 plus 6. I think everybody out there knows that that's not a good number. Yeah, Revelation and, 13, 18. There it is. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and, and how many of us individually can examine ourselves and look at Galatians chapter 5 and say, hmm, yeah, I got some cleaning up to do. And, you know, the Lord recognizes that we have cleaning up to do and that we have repenting to do. And the Lord gave the example with his disciples where he washed their feet. Yeah. You know, when we walk around in this present evil world, we get dirty and we pick up sin. We are guilty ourselves and we need to get clean every day. And doesn't the Bible say that the Lord's mercies are new every day? Every morning. They're every new morning. every morning. Well, going back to that prodigal son yeah. in Luke chapter 15, um, when that son determined, he said, you know, I've sinned. I'm going to go back to my father. And that's all God wants you to do is, is come back to the to the heavenly father, the one who actually is the father of your spirit. He did give you that spirit and he doesn't want you to be separated from him. He wants you to prepare that heart so that his son can come in it and you can get that relationship. But when he came back, that father said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And that robe is the robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is woven together with the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. It's a gift from God. Amen. It's not something we have to produce. It's something God wants to give to us. He wants to give us his love. He wants to give us his joy. He wants to give us his peace. Peace on earth. Uh, my son was born today. The angels were singing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. That's the king of righteousness. He wants to give you the righteousness and the love and the joy and the peace and all that fruit. God wants to wants you to feast on a gift from heaven. Amen. And all we got to do is prepare our heart to receive that gift. Just open it up. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. You went right back to prepare, right yeah, where we started. There you go. We came all the way back, full circle. Make the preparations. Now, if you're lost, you need to bow the knee, get right with God. You know, receive Christ. That's what the Bible says. And, and one and, of the good things that you'll want to do, listener, and, and I had to do this myself, and, and perhaps Mark did this in his life, um, one of the best ways to prepare to receive the Lord is to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, I had, I had never really encountered it in my first 38 and a half years of life. I, I had never taken the time to look into the Bible. I had heard all of the aspersions cast on it by the world. It's just an old ancient book. And it was when I finally took the time to go to a Bible study. If you can find just a home Bible study, to, to study with uh, someone uh, over the kitchen table with a cup of coffee and open the word of God. That's one of the great ways to prepare your heart, in my thought. Well, you're reminding me now when I was a kid, I, yeah. grew, I grew up Roman Catholic. I grew up here in Western New York and my parents had a family Bible. This thing was gigantic. It was a big, huge <laughs> Bible, those. Yeah. you know, and it was the family Bible and you had the family tree in the front and, you know, we wrote down aunts and uncles and different, you know, family members. But we never really opened the Bible. We never looked at it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, once in a great a while, of I might, yeah, there, I might yeah. flip through a little <laughs> bit. But it wasn't something I really read. And if I tried to read it, I really didn't get anywhere with it. It was, it was kind of just foreign and unfamiliar to yeah. me. Yeah. And somehow there is just such a difference with the King James Bible. And like Pastor was talking about with the Book of Romans and the New Testament, yeah. both John and Romans. Boy, if you... I mean, you can find a King James Bible at practically any dollar store. Sure. And, you know, if you have trouble reading small print, then get large print. Get giant print. You'll be amazed at how how uh, welcoming it is to be able to read it easily. Yeah. Come here, as a matter of fact, at 271 Bucyrus. I just ordered a case of gi super giant print super giant. King James Bible. I think it's a 16 point fine it's really big i can read it without my glasses it's fantastic we'll give you one for free we want you to see this book to prepare your heart well he says taste and see that the lord is good go. because he is good i mean his the name himself <laughs> god good right yeah, amen. And, and the devil is you take that d off of there you have evil and there is a part in the scriptures where he asks who are you following 
You need to consider who you're following. Don't be following those works of the flesh that we read about. You want to be led of the Spirit and walk in the, the Spirit. And you want to be ready to prepare to meet thy God. That's really what needs to be done. Amen. And so, again, I said this earlier. In the last few days, I have run into a few different people who said, well, I guess I just have to follow after my heart. No, no, no. Don't follow after your heart. It's better to trust in the Lord. Yes. 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 So you really need to do that. And the word of the Lord. And that's why the voice cries in the wilderness. And and it's just a voice. And you know what he was crying? The word of God. And that's what we need. And, And thank you for listening to us on the What is Truth radio show. Again, we've been with you on Saturday mornings. There's talk. We'll be moving to Sunday. We will let you know when that will happen. Until then, uh, go to the website, weckbuffalo.com. You can listen to the old shows on the archive if you miss one. You can go to our site, Grace and Truth Church. It's one big, long word, graceandtruthchurch.org. Um, when you go to that homepage, it'll say sermons, click that, and then it'll say YouTube, click that, and a whole bunch of teachings will come up both uh, from the church, from the Sunday School Hour, and right here on our podcast, which is for WEC Radio. And until we're with you next week, uh, we thank you for listening. Thank you for the cards that you write us. But our recommendation, in order to prepare your heart for the way of the Lord, do like Jesus said, search the scriptures. And you'll know what is true. Amen.